So hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. I'm pretty excited to be here talking about our latest product launch 20.1. Uh, my name is Megan. I'm on the product marketing team and I'm here with Andy. So Andy, do you want to say a few words? Hi, everybody. My name is Andy. I'm a senior product manager on our team. I, I do a lot of work in our SQL product area. So things from developer tooling all the way to the queries, schema design, these kinds of things. And uh, we're really excited to, to speak with you all today. Cool. Yeah. And Andy had a lot of, <clears throat> Andy's team did a lot of work on this past release. So um, it's pretty cool that he can join us today. So just before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few little pieces of housekeeping. Uh, you'll see there's a, a little Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen. And you can definitely ask any questions you have in there throughout the webinar. So we're, we're going to try to get to the questions as they come up. And um, also we'll have some time at the end for questions. And then the next thing is just, we're gonna have a recording available after the call. So we're gonna send out a, um, you know, a recording of the webinar. You can rewatch it, you can share it. So just keep an eye out for that. And thank you all for being here today. We're just, we're excited to get started. <laughs> so, um, here we go. so uh, before we get into some of the stuff around our latest release, I wanted to go over this, the context in which we've made a lot of these updates and just kind of ground, yeah, ground the updates in what's what's going on in this day and age. So I think that recently as a company, we've been seeing these two main trends within our, our customers and our prospects we've been talking to. And they have to do with what's been happening recently in the world. And it, I don't think that the events that have been happening recently haven't necessarily, um, you know, created these, these trends a new, you know, they, they've been happening over the years, but we've really seen COVID-19 accelerating a lot of the stuff that's been going on. And I think that the first one is really that a lot of businesses have been moving way, way more to digital. Um, so this is like the new digital norm. And, you know, this is companies who have seen their workforce become completely remote and their infrastructure teams are having to deal with having this remote workforce and, and serving them all over the country. And then, um, as well as that, you know, you have cu customers like retail companies who are totally shifting the way that they're selling their products uh, to a to a totally digital way, and um, this is all these all these things are putting a lot of stress on infrastructure and IT teams. They're having to basically, you know, provide this always on service to their customers or their employees that's resilient um, and also very much more scalable than it's had to be in the past. So that's one thing we've, we've been seeing a lot of recently. And, um, you know, the other one is obviously, <laughs> this is a, a pretty difficult time economically for many, many companies. And this kind of uncertainty has placed a lot of stress on IT departments. Um, we've seen a lot of budgets being slashed and people are really trying to save money and, and cut costs. And I think that, you know, another important thing to consider is that companies that are able to adapt to this environment very well are going to be the ones that are going to, you know, la like last and be around, you know, 10 years from now. So this is sort of the context in which we want to think about some of the updates that we've made in 20.1. And um, so how has, how have we as a company been trying to address the needs of our customers and prospects during these times? I think that We've seen a lot of our, um, you know, these new deals or new new customers we've been signing in the past few months coming to us to sort of solve these these needs. And you'll see, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail of, um, you know, kind of an overview of Cockroach DB since I think we have some people who are watching today who aren't as familiar with the database. But we've really seen Cockroach DB, um, you know, addressing these needs and, and filling, uh, you know, providing this, these values for our customers. So. The first one is that Cockroach DB is, uh, you know, it's a really good path to this this digital future that I was just talking about because it's a completely cloud native database. So, um, you know, Cockroach DB gives companies a lot of the the scale they need in the cloud, and um, and lets them make their their stack completely cloud native. And the second thing is that, you know, compared to some databases like older database, like legacy databases like Oracle, CockroachDB is a lot cheaper. So we've seen a lot of customers turning to us because they're trying to save money um, <clears throat> with their IT budgets and as they move to the cloud. And then the final thing is that Cockroach, I think 
a lot, we get a lot of questions about why cockroach is called cockroach. And the reason why we named our database CockroachDB is because it's resilient like a cockroach, it can survive failures. And we really guarantee that people are going to get this always on availability they need to serve their customers um, during these times. So for those people who are not as familiar with how we actually technically achieve um, that value for our customers, we, I think, I think a really good way to think about CockroachDB is that we really wanted to provide this like familiar standard relational database interface to our customers who might be accustomed to using things like Oracle and MySQL and Postgres. Um, but we wanted to, under the covers, we wanted to make the database this cloud native database and reduce a lot of that, the complexity um, of running a database in the cloud. So, um, you know, on the surface, CockroachDB is, has a standard developer friendly SQL. Um, so whatever SQL func um, functionality you're used to, it's, you know, you, you can you do similar things within Cockroach um, and run your OLTP workloads on it. Things that really need that, that high level of transactional consistency um, that you would find in a traditional relational database. But then, as I mentioned under the covers, we do a lot of really interesting things that are completely baked into the architecture from the ground up. So things like being able to automatically shard data across the whole database. Um, so you can have a, a distributed cluster that's, that's done in a very simple way. Um, that bulletproof resilience. So what I was talking about before with, you know, cockroach being called cockroach DB um, for a reason. And then we're really able to meet the needs of customers distributed across the globe. Um, even though it's a, distribu a distributed database, we are able to provide local latencies. So I, I hope that's a kind of a good overview of Cockroach and its capabilities um, and kind of like the context in which we, we were thinking about the updates we made in 20.1. Okay, so transitioning a little bit. Um, in 20.1, the, the, the main theme of the launch which you may or may not have seen if you spent some time on our website is uh, build fast and build to last. Um, and what that means is they're like these, basically these two main components. Um, so when we're thinking about build fast, we're thinking about um, trying to enable uh, our customers and particularly um, the developers who are using CockroachDB to have this very simple um, interaction with the database to get up and running quickly and have a lot of that expected functionality. So if you think about how a lot of, a lot of companies have this accelerated transition to being digital, we want to make that transition as simple as possible. And one of those things is providing a database that, you know, works the way developers expect a relational database to work, integrates with all their tools and, um, you know, is, is relative, is pretty simple. So some of the characteristics in CockroachDB that already exist that I think a lot of our customers appreciate is that you can get started um, anywhere with the binary if you just download the open source version. You can get started locally on your laptop. Um, you can deploy anywhere within any cloud, on-prem, across clouds, and also the standard SQL that I was talking about before. Um, but then in 20.1, we really focused on having these like new productivity enhancements for developers. So we're gonna get into the details later and, and Andy is gonna talk a little bit about this as well, but this is a lot of ORM compatibility. Um, a lot of, you know, so expanding some of our Postgres SQL syntax, monitoring updates, things like that, that just really simplify the, um, the development process. And then the second part of the, the, the main theme that we're talking about here is build to last. Um, so, I was already talking about how Cockroach has this, what we like to call like bulletproof resilience built into the database. So, you know, it can survive outages. Um, but, and, and then as well as that, we, um, we're pretty proud of the fact that Cockroach has like complete ACID compliance. So the data is always consistent and always correct. Um, but in 20.1, we actually focused a lot on kind of like updating our multi-region performance so we can better better, um, you know, sort of even, I guess, kind of perform even better within multi-region settings and tightened up the database's security. So that's an overview of what we had um, 
within 20.1. And so I think let's, let's talk a little bit about this first bucket of uh, productivity enhancements. So I really like this, um, this like phrase code the way you code, because that it kind of like sums up what we, what we were thinking um, with a lot of these updates. So we wanted to make CockroachDB fit very seamlessly into our, you know, developers, what they're, what they're used to, what they're used to doing, um, what their work style is, what their workflow is. Um, and because of that, we added a lot of compatibility. First of all, we, we kind of increased the amount of um, Postgres syntax we have. So CloudHDB is Postgres wire compatible, um, but we added some more Postgres functionality to the database to kind of just increase the amount of tools that developers have um, in their toolkit. And also to make coverage more compatible with tools that use, you know, the, the Postgres syntax. And then as well as that, we also added um, a bunch of compatibility with some of these ORMs that you see on the screen to kind of help developers, um, you know, you be able to use Cockroach the way they want to use it. Um, and I think that's maybe a good time to pass it over to you, Andy, if you want to make a few comments about this, like Postgres compatibility and ORM mm -hmm. compatibility, since I know you, you worked on that a lot. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as Megan said, one of the things that we have really uh, learned from our customers over the, the last few months is that, uh, you know, it's important that the developers that you be able to set up the environment, your preferred development environment, exactly the way you want to. So if you like to use uh, Python, that you are able to use Django or SQL Alchemy or Pony ORM or Peewee or any of the the uh, ORMs that are in Python that you're familiar with and conversant and when you use Cockroach. And so, um, you know, we are wire compatible with Postgres, which means that uh, we sort of present SQL in, this, in the same way. Uh, and it means a lot of the tools that work with Postgres already today uh, work largely out of the box with Cockroach. Now, um, some of them need a few twi uh, tweaks uh, because we're a different underlying database behind that wire protocol. But, but largely, um, we're able to, to take advantage of that compatibility in order to, to rapidly improve and, and present a lot of these tooling uh, options and, and make them available to you as, as developers. Um, we have continued uh, this program. Uh, we, we talk a lot about what's here in 20.1. Um, we're also continuing to, to grow our ecosystem rapidly. We have new partners coming in uh, in many languages. We have new tools coming in beyond just ORM enhancements. Uh, and so we're really excited about this area as a, as a place that we see a lot of investment coming over the, the next uh, few months. And so um, I would definitely encourage anyone out there who's listening who said, uh, what about my tool? Does it work? You know, contact us on Slack. Let us know that it, you're interested in it. And um, there's a good chance that it, it will work out of the box. But if not, we're, we're happy to work on it and, and make sure that you can use whatever preferred development environment you want with CockroachDB. Absolutely. And yeah, definitely. That's a good point. We have a community Slack. So if you guys are not um, part of that yet, that's a great place to ask questions and to give product feedback and um, connect with other people, so. Hey, Megan, real quick before we continue, there's um, one or two questions in the chat that I, I think okay. would be worth answering right now. Um, yeah. So one of, our, one of our users asked us, um, is Cockroach an open source DB? Is it your own tech? Um, yes, we are an open source database. Uh, we have a, a, a BSL licensed product and a CCL licensed product. Uh, and so we are completely source available. All our code is out there. It's on GitHub. It's available to be reviewed. Uh, it's our, our sort of own technology. Um, we obviously have integrations with, with various other um, components here, but, but yes, we are our own open source product and it is completely free and able for you to, to download and try out and use. We do have an enterprise product that, that has um, a few features that are in that capability, um, including support, um, but we are an open source product and it, it is our own technology. Cool. Thank you. So one of the other um, big areas we focused on in 20.1 it, within this, um, this umbrella of developer productivity was our monitoring. So we, we understand that there's a lot of monitoring and optimizing that goes into running your database. And we want to make it as simple as possible for people. So we actually have this admin UI, which there's a screenshot of it on the slide. And um, it's, a, it's an awesome way to for people to monitor their clusters. We've added a bunch of new capabilities to it, like 
this network latency page, which you can see where it basically, it can kind of show the, the latencies between all the different nodes in your cluster and you can figure out if you think some latency is too high and then address what's going on there. Um, and we also did a, a whole overhaul in the UX UI of the, um, the admin UI. So I think the product design team did an amazing job making it really beautiful and user friendly. Um, we've added a slow query log, which, you know, you can, people might be familiar with this from other databases, but you can take queries that are, you know, slower than you would like them to be and, and log them to a separate file. And then you can like analyze what's going on in that file. Um, so that helps a lot as well. And then um, some other, adding some other pages into our admin UI. So every single person who, every time you, if you download the open source um, version of the database, you can immediately have access to this admin UI. And you can also have access if you're using enterprise or I don't know, I don't remember if you mentioned Cockroach Cloud, Andy, but Cockroach Cloud is our, our cloud version of the software. So it's, you know, we Cockroach Labs will host the database for you and, um, you know, completely maintain it and, and do everything on that side of things. So you don't have to worry about that work. Um, and you can just focus more on, I guess, your development. Yeah, that's a great point, Megan. We, we should definitely make sure to talk about Cockroach Cloud today throughout the, the presentation because all the, all the things that are available in our, um, you know, on-premise product are also available in Cockroach Cloud. And, uh, you know, that's a, a, one of the great advantages of, of how we deployed. Um, there's a couple of quick hitting questions that I think are also worth uh, dropping in here real quick before we continue the next slide. Um, a lot of compatibility are into questions. So um, we have a question about, are you planning to make a MySQL compatible or compatible with MariaDB? Uh, right now, we're not planning to, to work on that right now. Um, we do have um, tooling available to help you migrate over to Cockroach. And um, we'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have in the process. Um, but we, we don't plan to do a, a MySQL compatible interface at, at this time. Um, Another question is, um, are the binaries for your enterprise product identical to open source? Um, the, the binary is the same, you just have to pass an enterprise flag. Um, in Cockroach Cloud, this is kind of done for you automatically. On premise, um, there's actually a, a, you can get a, a free trial license to try this out and pass that in. And then, um, you know, should it be something that you're interested in doing, you know, you can uh, work with sales to, to set up a more permanent one there. Um, and then the last question that's related to this is there's a question about uh, what version of Postgres feature, feature compatible with you are as far as wire protocol. Uh, right now we're advertising uh, wire and feature compatibility with 9.5 with Postgres. Uh, we're actually considering uh, increasing that uh, compatibility version uh, in a future release. Um, but I think um, one thing to keep in mind is that there are a lot of SQL features and there's a long tail here. And so um, we, we have implemented some features that are newer than that, but uh, but um, it will take some time to, to catch up for all of the features. But, but for features we have implemented, uh, 9.5 is what we advertise now, and, and we're uh, evaluating upgrading that in the future. Cool. So another super exciting um, capability that we've added for 20.1 is um, online primary key changes. Um, and I think that honestly, I think Andy, I think I'll just let you talk about this since you, this is your area and, and this is actually what Andy's going to be doing a demo on later. So do you want to just give an overview of, um, what's going on here? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, in, in Cockroach, uh, we have a concept of primary key changes that are similar to what exists, uh, in, in Postgres. It's just that in Cockroach, they, they up until this point have been both a physical property and a logical property. And so what I mean by that is that um, primary key is actually how data is stored on the disk. And uh, because of that, it made it actually a little bit challenging for people who wanted to update their primary key. Um, because we, right now, that's how we sort of represent and, and treat that information on disk. And, and this was actually an important decision and design consideration we made because it enabled one of our um, key features, geopartitioning. And so geopartitioning lets, uh, lets you actually, um, you know, take portions of your data and, and pin them to certain localities so that you can put the data closer to the user. And so 
um, you know, if you were starting from a primary key in which you didn't have information here ready for this, uh, and you wanted to upgrade your primary key in order to have location be a part of it in order to take advantage of features like partitioning, um, it, was a, it was a bit of a manual slog process. And so um, we thought it was really important to make this uh, easier on developers, to make it easy for you to future-proof your business as you grow from a single region to multi-region. And so we spent a lot of time this year uh, working on making an online primary key change. And so what we mean by when we say online is that just like our, our schema change process, um, you can change this primary key without locking out the table or without taking your database offline. So mm -hmm. this gives you the primary flexibility. It gives you the option to um, you know, iteratively update your primary key as your needs change, um, all with sort of out having to pay the price of, of taking your database down. And so we'll go through a demo today of um, how you might take a, a sample table uh, and you know, go from a single region to multi-region. And then we actually have a little bit more involved demo that we'll show as well um, to explain how that works in more detail. Cool, thanks. Yeah, and um, before before 20.1, I think ever since like maybe the second version of the software, I'm, I'm not sure, but way back we had, we've had online schema changes. Um, so this is just an extension of that. So letting you actually change the primary key online. Absolutely. Um, so just now going into the second bucket of updates, so build to last, um, there's a, there's two main things in here. So the first is updates to multi-region performance. Um, so, you know, when CockroachDB was built from the ground up to be a distributed database, um, so we have these, these capabilities built into it that allow you to, you know, get local latencies. Um, local latency reads and writes, even if your cluster is distributed. And um, one of those those features that Andy mentioned, um, or those capabilities that Andy mentioned is the geo partitioning capability, which lets you basically tie data to a certain location. Um, so that, you know, if you have a customer in Florida, um, and, and your, your database is distributed, you can tie data at the row level um, for that customer to a region near Florida um, to, you know, decrease the latency of, of um, you know, the reads and writes. So we, you know, we, we've made a, an update that's pretty exciting that's going to allow um, basically more of our customers to use um, this feature called follower reads, um, which lets you get very low latency reads um, within a distributed cluster. And I think it's, it's just good because we, you know, we had follower reads beforehand, before 20.1, um, but some customers weren't able to use it um, because they had some requirements that it wasn't meeting, um, though we do, ha we did have a lot of customers using it. We just, you know, s some people, some companies have much stricter requirements. Um, so now this is basically opening up that feature to a lot more of our customers. Um, so I know, Andy, if you want to give just like a, maybe a, a quick overview of for people who might be curious of how um, of how follower reads works at a technical level, since I think it's it's pretty unique to Cockroach and just might be kind of interesting to some people. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, follower reads. Uh, sometimes um, you you might hear similar concepts in other databases, also known as like stale reads, for example, um, are an option for. Uh, a situation in which you really need to have super low latency and you can afford to have stale data bounded by some framework. And so uh, what we mean by that is that uh, the stale data that we're, you're reading a few seconds into the past. So um, in 20.1, that limit is now about five seconds into the past. And so, you know, there, there are certain use cases in which you can imagine it's probably okay to read data that's about five seconds old, as long as the latency is really low. Um, we have customers, for example, that, that use this for um, identity and access management. So they, they want to be able to service uh, traffic with low latency, um, but these things don't change as frequently that they need to be updated um, you know, so stringently they need to have real-time data here. And so um, this is a, a, an important um, option in your schema and query design uh, that will allow you to um, you know, have a, a global table, have the ability to have users in multiple places, um, and then instead of, uh, instead of always having to read from what we call the leaseholder, uh, being able to, to read locally with these follower reads. Um, and so we think this is a, a really good trade-off uh, for certain use cases. Of course, like anything else, it's not, it's not you know, a panacea to be used in all use cases, but 
um, it's an important step of the, the multi-region journey. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that really differentiates Cockroach is that um, we allow you more building blocks to, to put the perfect multi-region journey together for your customers than any other database. And so we're, we're really excited about the improvements here, the reducing that staleness window down to only about five seconds, um, because we think it opens up uh, many more use cases for our customers. Thanks. Um, and then, yeah, and then the second part of the build to last, um, sorry if it's a little loud outside, I'm at my parents' place and they're having some yard work done. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so the, the, second, the second aspect is of, of the build to last thing is um, we, made it, we made a bunch of security updates. And I think one of the ones that I'm the most excited about personally is that we actually placed um, role-based access control into our open source version. So, um, you know, we, we've heard, we heard from people in the community, they wanted more control over um, security in that front. So we have, you know, placed that feature from enterprise into Cockroach DB core. Um, so I think people are excited about getting access to that as well in the community version. And then um, we did, we made some updates to the enterprise security features like adding encrypted backups. We already have encrypted, um, we already encrypt data at rest and in transit. Um, so encrypted backups is just another layer of security. And we updated a bunch, a bunch of more, a bunch more security things. So if you're interested in, in that side of things, you can definitely take a look at our docs. Um, so I actually, you know, before getting to the, into the demo, I just wanted to, I guess, go back to what we had, what we mentioned a little bit earlier about Cockroach Cloud. Um, so this is our, our self, uh, sorry, our hosted, our managed service of Cockroach DB. Um, so you can basically just log on to, you can go to cockroachlabs.com. You can go to the Cockroach Cloud um, portal. You can log on, create an account and um, spin up a cluster on, on Cockroach Cloud um, on the portal. And this is our, our fully managed service. So we at Cockroach Labs, we have a team of SREs that will make sure the database is on and configured properly and you know, maintain it, do backups and everything like that. Um, so all these updates are within Cockroach Cloud as well. And um, on the similar front of security, we actually, the, the big things that we've added to Cockroach Cloud, in addition to all these other updates, um, for 20.1 were VPC peering. And we also got our SOC 2 um, type one certification at Cockroach Labs. So we we know that we have some customers who are excited because you know they're they have these um, security requirements, whether they have to use VPC peering or or work with vendors who are SOC 2 compliant. Um, and we now have those. So just wanted to mention that as well. And I this think, is probably a, yeah. a good chance to answer a, a couple of questions oh, yeah, yeah. Go as we've it. gone through. So I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go through a quick hit here. Uh, yeah, uh, one of our attendees asked, um, if you develop on-premise, is there a simple migration to the cloud? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So um, I'm not sure if you mean developing locally, but using a Cockroach Cloud cluster, uh, that's your production cluster, that's super easy to do, it's not a problem. Um, also, if you want to start out hosting your database yourself on premise and then eventually migrate to having Cockroach Cloud host that for you. Both of those are well tried uh, journeys that, that many customers of ours have used and, and I've really had no problem with. So that's, it's not any, any challenge there to, uh, to, to do that. Um, another customer uh, or another attendee asked, uh, can you use the new UI with uh, Cockroach V19, uh, the 19.1 or 19.2? Uh, and the answer is no. Right now, the uh, web UI product is uh, baked into the binary. So uh, in order to use the new web UI features, you need to upgrade the product as well. Um, we are considering whether or not we would want to decouple that at some point in the future. But uh, for now, you need to upgrade in order to take advantage of the new web UI features. Um, another person asked, uh, asked, uh, do you support AWS and Azure uh, deployment? And yes, we, we work on, uh, on the on-premise version, we, we support any cloud, public or private. So you can use any of the big three, uh, any, any your own uh, private cloud if that's available to you. Um, we support all of those. Uh, right now, Cockroach Cloud supports AWS and GCP. Um, but there are plans to expand that to other clouds in the future. So um, we really consider ourselves a cloud agnostic database. And that's one of the differentiators for us is that, um, you know, if you use Cockroach DB, you're not locked into a long contract with one specific uh, provider. So you, you have that flexibility. Um, and 
ones. Let's see if there's any other quick hitting ones here. Um, there's a question about what is the scalability with regard to millions of transactions per second. Um, there's no theoretical limits to, to cockroach scalability for a horizontally scalable database. So you, as you continue to add nodes to the cluster, um, you can continue to, to scale up the, the amount of throughput uh, received. And we have actually demonstrated that through an industry benchmark called TPCC. Um, there's a blog post where we talk about 100,000 warehouses, which is you know more than a million transactions per minute, which are these um, complex, uh, you know, well-designed OLTP transactions. So um, there's there's really no no theoretical or, or you know small limit right now to, to scaling, um, and we'd be happy to to walk you through what that looks like and and uh, you know help with anybody who who wants to go through that scaling exercise. We're, we'd be happy to, to talk more about that. In fact, um, one thing I should also mention is that if we if we don't get to one of your questions today, uh, we do have a public Slack. Uh, so feel free to bring those questions over to our public Slack, and uh, if we don't get to them today, we'll we'll, we'll get to them then. Yeah, we can also follow up um, after the webinar with people if they have more questions. Um, all right, I'm just double checking. Uh, so there's another question in here about um, a comparison to Cassandra. We've actually done a previous webinar of comparing CockroachDB to Cassandra and talking about what that looks like. Um, so uh, that that is where I would point you there. We're, we're not going to be able to dive into that today, but uh, we do actually have a webinar on that topic that I would I would encourage you to to think about. Yeah, yeah, I second that. It's a, it was a really good one and provides a lot of information. So. Uh, another attendee asked about performance comparisons versus Oracle, SQL Server, et cetera. Um, a lot of the uh, databases don't allow for public benchmarking. Uh, so what we have been able to do is, is compare to Amazon Aurora using TPCC, in which we demonstrate that uh, we can even handle uh, a much higher scale and a much higher throughput than Amazon Aurora. And that's that's a part of that TPCC blog post as well. So I would, I would encourage you to check it out if you're interested in the uh, performance uh, situation. Um, and then there's a, finally, there's another question about how do you compare architecturally to Aurora, which is multi-region, multi-master. We are significantly different than our, how Aurora has set up their multi-master architecture. Um, and we, we won't probably be able to go into that fully today. Um, but their multi-master architecture kind of limits the ability for them to scale out and for them to add additional regions in their support. And um, our architecture under the hood is a little bit different uh, and doesn't have those same limitations. So there's, again, there's, there's more uh, blogs and white papers on that that we can direct you to. And you can just bring us over to the, the Slack community to, to talk about that. All right, I'm going to pause there um, because I think it's time to, to get to the demo. But uh, we'll, yeah. we'll circle back for any questions at the end of the demo as well. Perfect. So I'm going to stop sharing and let you take over. All right. All right. So uh, we are going to do a live demo here today. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is we're actually going to use a feature called Cockroach Demo. Uh, and what this does is actually uh, allows you to simulate setting up three nodes uh, just by having Cockroach uh, developed and running locally on your, your laptop uh, so that you can try out different features. And so um, you can see that we have various flags that we passed here in the demo. Um, we've actually set this up to demonstrate three nodes. Um, and uh, you can see that we actually start with a database already present. Uh, we're going to use an example today throughout all of this about a fictional ride sharing company that we've named Mover. Uh, the idea is that uh, this can kind of demonstrate some of the values and capabilities of Cockroach and that um, in demo we have it sort of start, uh, come with it by default so that you have something to play around with, you have some data to try things out. But of course you can always make a new database and, and try things out. So we're going to look at uh, one of the tables here today called the rides table. So we have actually set this table up uh, to be uh, ready for a um, multi-region scenario or um, multi-availability zone scenario. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, we have this concept uh, called primary keys. And uh, primary keys, uh, in this case, you might be more familiar with setting them with an ID location. That's the beginning part here. Um, in order to take advantage of this feature that we call geopartitioning, you actually need to use what we call a compound primary key in which you have city or state or some uh, region or locality information that comes before the ID here. 
Um, and so we've set this up for you kind of automatically, but I'm gonna show you what you would do if you, you already had a cluster, you already had a, a table, uh, and you needed to change that primary key in order to make it work for City. So as I was mentioning, you can kind of create your own database uh, in the blog here. Uh, let me just bring that up so you can see a little bit. And uh, we're gonna use that database uh, now so that we don't have any tables uh, present. Uh, so we can see that we're, we're not uh, reusing the original rides table. So let's make a new rides table here. This rides table is a, basically the same as the previous rides table, the one that comes from default here. Um, there's a couple of changes. I removed a bunch of the foreign keys since we don't have other tables here present. Um, and just really kind of simplified it down so that you can see what's going on here. Um, and if we, uh, if we you know, look here, we can notice that there's no primary key with city in front of the ID here. So we're gonna run this alter table statement here. And uh, let's see, um, let me move this up a little bit. So this alter table statement is how we change our primary key. So we can see that it's sort of this familiar uh, canonical syntax alter table. We're letting you know it's the rides table. And now we're introducing this alter primary key using columns. So now we're actually telling it what we want that primary key to be. We're saying uh, we want it to be city ID instead of what it is now with just ID. So uh, we run this schema change and uh, what you can see is actually a couple of cool things that, that are highlighted here. First, um, we've actually introduced a, a new little feature to help with understandability and discoverability uh, called notices. Uh, you might hear them called hints or other things as well, um, where we can provide a little bit extra information to you uh, if you're working within the SQL shell directly. Um, and so what we've done here is we've actually let you know that you've completed the schema change and that it's kind of finalized asynchronously. In this case, I, we don't have very much data in the table. In fact, we have no data in the table because we didn't insert any. Uh, so it's super fast. Um, so we didn't see that same kind of waiting here. But uh, if we go back and we look at the uh, show create table now, uh, we can see that we now have a primary key here and that the primary key is city ID. So this was a, a pretty simple, fast example, just showing you how you can kind of try something right out in Cockroach Demo and set it up. But we have a little bit more involved demo uh, that uses Docker that, that I'm gonna walk you through now. So I'm gonna just uh, get out of the uh, Cockroach Demo area, which you can see kind of as soon as you exit, it's, it's demo is kind of shuts itself down so that you don't, you don't have to keep it around. And uh, we're gonna do a couple things here. So I'm gonna set up uh, three nodes on, uh, on my machine here so that we have a, a cluster. Um, Cockroach uses a quorum uh, and feature for replication. So uh, we like to have you know, uh, three nodes or, um, or more in order to have the replica spread out across those three nodes. So we, we have set up three nodes and I'm, I'm going a little fast through this part, but this is really just background for setting up and initializing the cluster. We have actually a really good documentation on this that can show you how to set up each one of these things as well. And then um, the contents of this demo will be in a blog post uh, in, a, in a few weeks as well. So I've set up the cluster. I need to add uh, a database mover. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm just kind of um, passing the, the create database mover over. Um, and now we're gonna actually get to take away, uh, start to take advantage of uh, Docker and uh, the setup that we put in place. So um, the first thing I'm gonna do is generate some fake data from the mover database. Uh, and so there's a, a series of flags here that we pass in here. Um, you know, we're passing the number of users, number of rides, number of vehicles. Um, and you can see that we're sort of generating a lot of data on the fly for different cities. Um, you know, we'll, we'll show this here in a minute, but. Uh, we've got you know Washington DC and, and various other things. So we, we kind of use this to speed up the process of showing off this demo here. Um, and in fact, we can, uh, we can go to the web UI now and uh, see exactly what this looks like. So um, we have three nodes that are set up here in the web UI. Uh, we can see um, metrics, we can see databases. So we can see that we have actually created uh, multiple tables as a part of this Docker image, um, and then we have multiple pieces of, of data kind of going on here. So uh, I think the first thing we'd want to do in order to demonstrate that uh, how online primary key changes work is we need to point some load at the cluster. Um, this will let us uh, have something to simulate a real application uh, that's servicing traffic so we can show you the online nature of the primary key change. So let's go back. Uh, here to the window. 
and uh, let's start to generate some data. And so uh, what you'll see is that this starts to, uh, it starts to um, create data for the simulate queries and process the data that we created in here. And um, this will kind of print out uh, nicely for you to see uh, in the, the shell, um, kind of these, these queries that are happening. You can see the P95 and all their latency information, uh, the apps per second. Um, it's these various uh, query titles that, we, that we've come up for to simulate different aspects of the load. And so we're gonna leave this running in one window on the SQL uh, in, a, in the shell. Uh, and then we're gonna go to another window. Um, Andy, do you wanna, we had a few questions come in. Do you wanna take now as a time to pause and answer or do you wanna do it at the end? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Let me um, just pull up. We had someone ask, was the alter table made with node data in the table? The first one I showed you in the demo was made with no data in the table. That's why we're showing you a little bit more involved one. So one of the steps that we took here, this Docker statement right here, was putting data in those tables so that we have data to take advantage of. And the step I just completed that we went through here is pointing load so that we're accessing that data in the table, making changes, so we're simulating what a real application looks like. So it's kind of a, a little bit, it, while it's still sort of a, a simulation application, it's a little bit more realistic than um, just making a, a change on a, a simple table. Perfect. And um, someone asked, uh, what happens when a primary key um, was now changed to a two-part primary key? Yeah, so uh, it's a good question. So um, there's a couple of things that, that happen there. Um, one, we have to update the uh, primary key itself, uh, which is one action that we take. Another thing is we have to update any of the secondary indexes uh, that we're going to change. And in fact, that's a good transition to the next step in the demo, which is um, let's uh, let's show you what you would need to do in order to actually update this uh, cluster. So we are passing a little nice little flag here in this Docker example preview queries. This is telling you what we're actually doing as we upgrade the cluster. So we're gonna do a couple things here. We're gonna, because we have multiple tables that we showed you before in the web UI, the users table, the rides table that we talked about previously. Um, we're gonna run a series of changes here to change the primary keys. Uh, for example, this is, the, this is the next one actually right here is the one I showed you as a, a brief example. Um, we're going to uh, need to change the indexes that are present in our cluster so that we can take advantage of city and other things. The nice thing about this alter table statement is that um, it actually updates the secondary indexes um, that are taking advantage of this in the process of doing it. Um, but there are some other things that we need to, can, to change here outside of this space. Um, and so this is actually showing all the work that the next command is gonna do for us. And in fact, if we go back to the, uh, to the web UI now, we can see that uh, we started to have uh, data run. This is where in this metrics tab here, it's that second tab here in the web UI. Uh, we can see that we have a certain number of selects, updates, inserts, deletes that are kind of going on here to simulate this workload. Uh, we're keeping an eye on our latency so we can see um, you know, where things are at here. And um, we'll see what happens now as we actually run through some of these changes over here. So again, we have the, the workload running in the other tab, and in this tab, now we're gonna um, run through these series of uh, changes in order to demonstrate what it's like to upgrade your cluster from that single region to, to multi-region. So it's kind of printing out information that's telling us what's happening as we go here. We're applying schema changes, we're altering primary keys. Um, we could watch this information and in show jobs within the SQL shell, for example, or we could actually go and look in our jobs tab in the web UI as well. And what we'll see is that uh, we have a couple of steps that have started. We have some alter tables that have started to come into place here. Um, we have some cleanup that has happened and some that's continuing on. We're creating a few new indexes and you can kind of always track what's happening with your jobs here in this jobs framework in addition to, to being able to do that within the SQL shell. So if we go back, we can see that we're now sort of in the phase of altering foreign keys. Um, and now this is kind of presenting back to us that it's now completed all of the work that we've outlined. It's completed all of these series of um, altering tables, dropping indexes, and continuing on here in the process. And if we go back and look in the web UI, we can see that 
um, these jobs have not succeeded. Uh, they talked about their duration, kind of can, can filter through what's happening here. There are a couple of garbage uh, collection things that are shown that are not done here. This is waiting for the GC window. Uh, we defaulted to 25 hours right now in Cockroach in order to make sure that there's not actually something that, that was mistakenly deleted or something else in this process here, but uh, these will get cleaned up in the process of doing that. And if we go back to the metrics tab, we can see that uh, we didn't really have any kind of interruption as we were making these changes in here and latency stayed the same uh, while we were having kind of load present on the cluster. So this is a, admittedly a, a pretty fast demo of what this looks like. There's a lot that we could go through to talk about each individual component. Um, this will be present in the blog post that we publish and we will also show everybody um, the exact steps and commands that we went through here in the demo today um, in order to see kind of exactly how this works. So for there, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and awesome. uh, see what questions we have available. Yeah, we had a few questions come in. All right, I'm gonna look through this. Uh, so there's a question about what is the performance impact to queries when an online schema change is running? Um, so there's a, there's, um, it depends, I guess the, the proper answer on all of these things are, it, uh, it depends on what schema change you're running and what queries you're talking about. Uh, in the generic sort of most sense of online schema changes, uh, we try to limit the impact on foreground traffic uh, by performing the, the schema change, um, but by not sort of not taking off resources that take advantage here. In the case of the online primary key changes that I just demonstrated, we actually, uh, we build the new indexes in the background and then switch over when that's completed. And so um, this is a, a step that we've taken forward to kind of reduce the, the chance that, um, that there is kind of any major impact on the, on the uh, foreground traffic. Now, that being said, the cluster is doing more work because um, in addition to the load you are already handling, you're asking it to rewrite things. And, and in the case of online primary key changes, you're actually, um, it can be three indexes or more that you end up creating. So um, we would recommend to uh, make sure that you have enough capacity on the cluster, that there's enough CPU available. Um, you know, keep, keep that in mind as you're doing this, but it's a little bit easier to add capacity with Cockroach. You know, adding a node is, is very trivial. Um, than with other databases. And so we, we think this is a little bit easier experience than having to schedule downtime where you take your whole application down uh, and can't service customer traffic. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so there's a question about the notices feature. Um, here's a suggestion for schema change notices, display the relevant job IDs information. Um, that's a great suggestion. Um, you can actually, uh, run show jobs and it'll show you the jobs that are in progress in the SQL shell. It'll give you job IDs. It'll show you the specific query that's happening. Um, it's that same information. It's actually what's used to populate the um, web UI portion that we talked about earlier. Um, but we are always on the lookout for areas that are confusing or where a little bit of extra information would be helpful. And I think that's one area that we, we see notices helping in the future. So um, if there are other ideas that anybody has on, on the call, feel free to file a GitHub issue or let us know on Slack. But but we're always committed to trying to provide you a, as much information as possible to, to help make decisions and, and help make things easier on you as developers. Uh, Megan, I saw in here that there's a question about, um, you know, can you use Cockroach Cloud today? So do you, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sorry, I didn't see the question. It was, it, was it just, can we, is it able to be used today? Or what? Yeah, can you use the, all these new features on Cockroach Cloud today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can. Um, so Cockroach Cloud runs the latest version of Cockroach DB. Um, so it's running Cockroach DB 20.1. And you can just go, go to our website and sign up um, and start using it immediately. So, um, Andy, do you want to take maybe like one, one or two more questions? I think this one of the interesting ones um, that I saw earlier was, um, does replication happen automatically across the cluster? Um, just by yeah, that's a, getting that's, cluster. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a great question. So uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Cockroach actually takes a lot of the, one of our, our guiding principles is to try to take the complexity out of the database, uh, out of your hands and put it inside the database to make it easier for you to maintain and administer database. And so um, we actually manage uh, 
we, we use the RAF protocol um, to manage our quorum of replicas. And so that means that um, we have automatically spread the replicas out for survivability and availability across your different nodes. And we take care of um, all kinds of options for you automatically. So we, we rebalance these as they're needed. We split the ranges, we um, merge ranges. We try to take care of all of this as much as possible to make sure that you don't have to have to deal with sort of manual sharding or any kind of the, the detailed nitty gritty details here. We actually try to, to abstract those away and, and use those via um, sort of well-known protocols here. And so uh, that's actually one of the things that we think is, is the best about Cockroach is how easy it is to administer and, and maintain your data, specifically as it grows in size as well. Absolutely. And I think maybe the last one, um, there was a question going back to what we were talking about earlier about the TPCC benchmark. And it was, why did you specifically select that benchmark? And I think um, I, I mentioned this really briefly at the beginning, but Cockroach is really, really great for um, OLTP workloads or workloads where you have um, a lot of, you know, heavy reads, writes, transactional workloads. So I think that that's, that's an important thing to know. We really, we really support those kinds of workloads really well. And um, TPCC is the benchmark for that. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Andy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, everything you said is true, Megan. And just to build on that, I think um, the nice thing about TPCC is that it, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't lend itself uh, well to, to vendor manipulation. Like we can't, you know, we, we can't just like make up a workload and tell you that we do a really good job on it. TPCC is something that had lots and lots of people participate in its design. It's a really well-designed workload. And so, you know, if we perform well on TPCC, then you can have some trust that, um, that we're actually a, a good database. And so I think that's something that's, that's really important to us is that, uh, you know, we don't think that a benchmark is, is really a public benchmark unless it's reproducible. And so we want to be able to show everybody all the steps we take. We want to um, make sure that we're using a workload that has stood the test of time, that has been well vetted by other people so that you can actually trust our results. And so um, in every one of our TPCC posts, we show um, links for how to actually replicate uh, and reproduce our findings. Um, and we think that it's, it's a, just a really good solid benchmark for making sure that, that uh, there hasn't been any sort of funny business that's been conducted there. Perfect. And I just want to share one more um, slide to end on. So let me know. Um, I think you can see my screen, right? Yep. Um, cool. So it looks like there are definitely a bunch of questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, so as Andy was saying before, please um, feel free to ask them in our community Slack. Um, we we love to answer the questions there and start discussions around them. And we can also, um, we'll, we'll hopefully try to follow up with some people on questions as well. And you can see, you know, this, the stuff that we covered today was only kind of like a, a small amount of what was actually in 20.1. So you can see everything that's new on our doc site. So that's cockroachlabs.com slash docs. And I think our docs are really helpful, not just for seeing what was in the release, but we have a lot of amazing tutorials there. And um, our docs team does a lot of really good work. So definitely check that out. And then there is, we have, uh, we have Cockroach University, which is our online training platform, which is totally free. There's a lot of videos in it and quizzes. So if you're interested in, in learning more of the basics, definitely take the get started course. So I think that offers a really good overview of um, some of the distributed concepts we talked about today, um, just to understand a distributed database in general, and then also dives into how to actually um, do some, some, some simple stuff on CockroachDB. And then finally, just the last thing is we were talking a little bit about Cockroach Cloud before. So we actually have a free trial of Cockroach Cloud for 30 days. So if you're interested in just trying out some of these um, new, new features um, or just playing around with Cockroach D DB a little bit, I think the easiest way is honestly on Cockroach Cloud. Um, so you can, you'll get a free code when you sign up for 30 days. Or of course, as Andy was saying, you can download the um, the open source version, the binary is right in our docs page and um, get started and I guess try out, uh, try it out. Um, and I think, I think that's honestly pretty much it. I think we're going to send out a survey. I think when you close the webinar immediately, you'll see a survey. So we always love hearing feedback on things that you might have liked to see more of or um, things that we did well, didn't do well. So definitely we take that feedback um, into account a lot. So, so please fill that out. And I guess just thank you everyone for coming out. Um, we, appreci we appreciate it, enjoy talking. Thank you, Andy, as well for your time. Yeah, thanks, Megan. We had a, we had a lot of fun today. So uh, definitely please reach out if you have any further questions. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone.